Hello guys, Winston here. A couple weeks ago, I was asked if I wanted to partake in the global insta-machinist effort to build Johnny 5, and obviously the answer was a resounding yes. It's been amazing watching the guys over at Saunders Machine Works bringing their passion project to life over the past few months, and being able to pitch in and make a few parts for them was an honor. So here's what I was tasked to make. This is part of the hand assembly for Johnny 5, and the middle segment of the thumb was my charge. There's a bit of geometry in here that's a little rough and not necessarily modeled for manufacturability, but I was given liberal creative freedom to adjust the model so long as it would mate back together with the original pieces. This is what I ended up changing. First up was this internal clearance feature. The way it was modeled initially would require some really strange multi-axis toolpaths to get into all these corners. Instead, I opted to create a stepped pocket that would provide comparable clearance but be far easier to machine. It's not quite as cool looking, but this is an area that's unlikely to be examined too closely. The other major change I made was to this corner. This is a sharp internal corner that could only be defined with a tool coming in from this orientation, but the rest of that contour would obviously be machined from the side. So to have to figure out how to blend these tool pads together would have been a little bit of a pain, especially for a three axis application. You could do this with multi-axis flow, but it's still really not the ideal way to transition between these features on this part. Adding in a simple little cutout like this would allow me to clean up the entire outer profile with a single continuous 2D contour toolpath. Now, because of an electrical glitch, you might say even a short circuit, Pavel the Pocket NC was out of commission when I initially started this project, so I had to make some additional adjustments to make this model machinable on a 3-axis CNC. These angled faces here are really only machinable from head on, so machining these features as is on my Shapeoko wasn't going to happen. At least not without a bit of bizarre work holding that I really wasn't keen on undertaking. But with just a little bit of redesigning, I could guarantee equal or greater clearance for the parts that my finger segments had to interface with, and this could be done in a regular setup held at 90 degrees to my other setups. And speaking of those setups, I did have to be conscientious of how I'd be work holding my piece. Clamping my part like this wasn't going to be a problem, but to bore the holes on the outer face of this part and machine the outer profile, the non-parallel edge on this finger segment would pose a bit of a problem. My solution was to machine the sides first, separately, and use an unmachined section of my stock as my parallel reference since I'd be starting from a rectangular block. And working backwards a bit more from this requirement, this rectangular starting shape for my stock was thankfully the perfect size to allow me to make two pieces from a length of 1 by 3 inch bar stock which I'd snagged from a drop spin at a local metal supply store for basically scrap prices. See, it's not always hoarding, sometimes preemptive purchases like this actually work out. Alright, let's head straight to machining since the tool pathing here isn't anything special, it's really just some 3D and 2D tool paths applied from different directions. The setups, work holding, and order of operations are really where I put most of my mental effort, and you'll see that in the machining porn coming up now. The first order of business was to cut down my bar stock to the little aluminum blocks that I'd machined these pieces from. Because of the thickness of my stock relative to the surface area available to me, I didn't want to rely on adhesive work holding. Instead, I would keep everything clamped down as best I could. By first machining and finishing the outer faces of my blocks, I could then apply clamps from these directions and maintain a certain level of work holding security as I cut out everything else. I kept a tiny tab in between my two pieces just to prevent any lateral movement of my parts. A single clamp is never ideal, so here I gain a little bit of redundancy in work holding by keeping my parts locked in relative to each other. I've also rotated my part here instead of mirroring it so that I'm machining the same side of my finger segment. When I flip these parts over, I'll only need to generate one set of tool pads. If you mirror these parts, you end up having to machine the left side of one and the right side of the other one. Since I know the exact position of my parts within this setup, I'm also taking the opportunity to machine in the features that have to be put in from this direction anyway. There's a couple holes as well as a slot feature to cut. I personally don't like cutting chamfers or countersinks on a desktop CNC because I feel like they don't always have the rigidity to get through them without a lot of chatter. Having the cutting edge at an angle always seems to generate cutting forces that go back into the machine a little bit funny. But one trick for roughing out these features so that your countersink or chamfer cutter doesn't have to push through a lot of material is to use a boring operation with a flat end mill. Yes, the same toolpath you'd use for boring out holes also works on conical features. Just make sure to leave a couple thou of radial and axial stock. I bored my countersinks to near final form with the expectation that I would simply hand drill them to completion after my parts were finished.
Once I had my intended blocks of stock cut out from the parent stock, I started machining from other orientations. First, the opposite side of what I'd finished, taking advantage of that parallel face I could clamp in the vise. You'll notice that I'm opting to find the center of my part by touching off on both sides of my stock. By averaging the two contact points, I don't need to worry about whether or not my stock is oversized or out of spec. And to ensure that runout doesn't play a factor in the measurement, I'm also clocking my end mill so it makes contact on the same side of the collet. Next, I opted to finish these two small flat faces on the ends of my part that had to be machined head-on because of the sharp corners in here. To hold these pieces in my low-profile vise, which wouldn't have a very large surface area to grip onto if I'd clamped it directly, I locked my parts between a pair of 1-2-3 blocks to help distribute the load. Again, it was a little tedious here to locate the zero on my part, but that's the price you have to pay on a 3-axis machine. Because of all the different orientations I would have to hold my part in, you really need to be as accurate as possible. Any error up front will compound over time. I machined away as little as possible here because any misalignment here would show up on the inner walls of the finger segments since I had to finish the majority of those surfaces from the top. Finally, on the fifth setup, I could perform the bulk of my material removal. But because there was one feature on the bottom of the part that I wanted to locate with maximum precision, this little hole that would require a tiny long reach end mill, I didn't want to finish the part on the shape oka. While I still had about 8 thou of stock to leave on my part's inward facing features, I transferred the part to the Nomad. Using a combination of 3D contours to clean up my walls most efficiently, as well as some additional 3D finishing toolpads, I machined away the excess stock left by the Shapeoko and brought my thumb segment to near completion. To finish things off, I loaded up a 0.04 inch end mill from Harvey Tool and had it bore a hole through the bottom and rough in the countersink. I will note that for all of the holes in my part, I programmed them to end about 0.01 inches past the whole bottom to ensure that they broke through to the other side. You never know when a little bit of inaccuracy or positive tolerance can come back to bite you. I managed to sneak in my logo on the bottom as well. Mission accomplished, two parts ready for Johnny 5. Except there was still a little bit of a hole in my heart because this part was begging to be made on a 5-axis machine. Unfortunately, because of the difficulties I alluded to earlier, Pavel was feeling a bit under the weather and beyond my ability to troubleshoot. So the Pocket NC team agreed to loan me a different machine so I could knock out this part before the holidays. I would like to introduce you to Pasha, and she is a proper and modern V210 built with the more rigid rotary axis bearings and a number of small design improvements that I appreciated right off the bat. Because of the size of Johnny 5's thumb segment, I knew I would have to orient my part sideways and not coaxially with the B axis like I did with the Malice Cage. And of course, with my penchant for machining unusually large parts on the V210, this also meant I would have to break out the low profile mount I made for work holding on the Pocket NC because a regular vise just wouldn't cut it. Since I'd have to prep my stock on the Shapeoko, I gave Pasha a head start by pre-roughing a channel through the middle of the part so that when I applied an adaptive roughing toolpath, I wouldn't have to make a bajillion stupid tiny arcs through the middle of the part which can be a bit of a time sink with the Pocket NC's slow rapid speeds. The Shapeoko doesn't quite have the same rigidity, but it does have the power and speed to blow through aluminum several times faster. Of course, if I had a Bridgeport mill, this could go even faster, but you can't win them all. With the channel machine through the part, I equipped Pasha with a specially modified end mill. This tool originally started life as a regular 278Z single flute from Carbide3D, but thanks to a bit of grinding from my buddy and podcast co-host Chris Lee, it now has a relieved shank so it doesn't rub on the walls when cutting past a 3 quarter inch depth. So not only would I be able to finish really deep walls with this end mill, but because of its diameter I would have a ton more rigidity. And an additional benefit of using a quarter inch cutter is that I have a higher SFM. The velocity of the cutting edge is twice that of an eighth inch end mill at the same RPM, so it works better in aluminum. It doesn't quite have the magic of the V250's high speed spindle, but it's the closest I can get on the V210. This tool and machine combination yielded really good results, and after roughing everything out I was pretty happy with how things were going. And because I could hit this point from any orientation, I could also do these angled faces that I could only approximate on a 3-axis machine.
I step through smaller and smaller tools to establish the rest of my features here. Next, a 3mm Datron single flute ball and mill to machine the radius around the bottom bend. I'm using a pretty funky looking flow toolpath here just because I wanted to get some more practice with its toolpathing parameters. The ultimate goal with a toolpath like this is to never let the center point of a ball and mill touch the part, because at that zero SFM point you end up basically smearing metal instead of achieving a clean cut and good surface finish. For the second to last toolpath, I loaded up my Harvey Tool 40 thou long reach end mill and let Pasha loose. Because the spindle is oriented horizontally, I felt pretty comfortable that the chips would clear themselves from the hole. And finally, we could work on that glorious final tab. I loaded up an 8th inch carbide 3D single flute end mill and used some 3D contours to clean up everything under the part except for my stump. Then I used a well contained 3D contour that referenced that stump as stock in order to adaptive clear it away. I had a tiny bit of vibration at the end, but I still considered it a success. And of course, I did try and run this a second time, and I cranked up my speeds and feeds and depth of cut based on what I'd learned about the part and Pasha during the first run, but in my haste and hubris I overlooked a critical artifact of more aggressive cutting parameters. When you do a 3D adaptive toolpath, not only will Fusion avoid axial stock to leave, but it will leave a certain excess margin less than or equal to that of your fine step down. If your cut depth isn't evenly divisible by your step down, there will be a remainder. Because I was annoyed with how often my adaptive toolpath would flow over the top of my part, I set my fine step down larger than I should have, and that left a sizable skin of axial stock on my floor. The bottom of my part after initial roughing had about three times as much material as I was expecting. When I went to finish this surface, I ended up with so much vibration that the end mill started digging into the walls causing a feedback loop of chatter that ruined the finish of the part. This was of course a huge letdown, but it's part of the learning process. Now after an adaptive clear, it'll be standard procedure for me to throw on a horizontal or 3D pocket toolpath to bridge the gap between roughing and finishing, and ensure that I only have as much stock to leave as I expect. These lessons learned are always the most valuable part of a project for me because I can carry them forward and use them to improve future projects. I ran out of time to run a third attempt on this part before the holidays, but in the end it's still mission accomplished. A pair of 3-axis variants and one 5-axis backup of Johnny 5's thumb segments are on their way to Ohio where they'll hopefully be successfully integrated with the rest of the assembly. I really enjoyed this project because it gave me the opportunity to try some new things. On the 3-axis side, it forced me to get creative with my work holding and to carefully consider toolpath order so I could leverage the flat faces I already had. On the 5-axis side, I got to try a new tool combination, the Carbide 3D quarter-inch single flute on a V210 for aluminum, and I ended up really loving it. It sounds so much better than an 8-inch tool on the Pocket NC. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC content and DIY nonsense.